Hey folks, Scott Weingart here, and this is the MCRIT Podcast. Today on the podcast, I want to discuss a topic that is not clinical. And now I have a buttload of clinical stuff in the pipeline, already recorded, and plans to do a whole bunch more. So you will get a ton of clinical stuff in the coming weeks, don't you worry. But today I want to talk about something um, that I think is equally important as how to intubate a crashing patient, and that is the issue of burnout. In the course of my coaching work with my partner, Rob Orman, especially after COVID, even before that, but especially during and after COVID, we've seen an enormous amount of burnout in emergency medicine and critical care and other acute care specialties. I'm sure it's all of medicine, but those are the ones I deal with primarily. And over the course of this work, we have protocolized our approach to burnout. And what I want to talk to you about today is the MCRIT model of burnout that I've come to having read all of the extent literature I could get my hands on, dealing with multiple clients, talking to incredibly smart people in the field. Uh, the way my mind works is I, I need a model. I need to kind of have a foundational rationale for the work that I want to do. You know this from the way I deal with issues in emergency critical care and resuscitation. Well, Today, I'm going to apply that same MCRIT approach to the issue of burnout, and I'm going to present to you, in my mind, the, the unified model of burnout, why it happens, how to fix it. This is a visual podcast. Now, you could handle that fact in one of two ways. There is a video version of this that you could find at mcrit.org 349. So if you started listening on audio and you would prefer to just see what I'm talking about, the actual flow chart as I go through it, you could just go over to mcrit.org slash 349 and you'll find the video there. You can find it on YouTube as well. But I gotta say, like while it's a little bit visual, you do just find having a printout of the flow chart, which you could just pause the episode right now, go to mcrit.org slash 349, print out the one page PDF, have it in front of you, and then go back to listening on audio and you would lose nothing. Or alternatively, you could just listen to what I'm saying, and you will follow. It's just, I think, a little bit tougher to not see the flowchart in front of you. Okay, so with that introductory stuff out of the way, let us dive right into the MCRIT burnout model. And I guess we'll start here at the very top, which is we are in a challenging job. If you're in the ICU, if you're in the ED, it's challenging. It's, it's built to be that way. That's why uh, we are remunerated well, and it's why um, we enjoy our job. Uh, the lack of challenge would actually leave us bored for the most part. Challenges are fine. Challenges are actually wonderful. They actually propel us to get better, to use creative brainstorming. Uh, challenges are great. Now, from that box of the challenging nature of our work, is that these challenges could be perceived as stress or as threat. So the challenges through our mindset, through the lens of our mindset, can get converted to something with a negative valence, stress, threat. And the arrow between those two boxes is indeed mindset. And now, I am not blaming you for burnout. Burnout is at all times, a systems issue. And in fact, given my druthers, I would happily cure it at the level of the system. But when clients come to me burnt out, I don't have access to their system, and neither do they. I mean, they can make small inroads, but for the most part, what we have to deal with is taking a situation that's not ideal and making it optimal for the individual involved. And that's why I say, you know, your mindset plays an enormous role in whether or not those challenges will start accruing negative effects. And so let's just take, we're going to talk a, a bit more about that in just a second. But for now, just understand there's challenges at work that are filtered through our mindset and predicate on our mindset are whether these are perceived as just challenges or they uh, fall down to the level of stress and threat, negative valence perceptions. All right, now that just having these stresses and threats at work won't lead to burnout. Um, it's when they start accumulating enough that they spill over into our life outside the hospital. When they start having pervasive effects 
on our ability to interact with our loved ones, our ability to sleep, all of the good stuff in the world that we want outside the hospital if uh, the stresses and threats are casting a pail over those things. That is when we get into the burnout cycle. So when we look at this box I have on the flowchart of perceived as stress or threat, there's an arrow pointing to the burnout cycle, and on that arrow is bring it home. When we start bringing it home is when we get into burnout. The analogy I give is you wear these clogs or shoes at work and they get blood and vomit and all sorts of excreta on them. And that's fine because what you're supposed to do is leave them in your locker or leave them in the trunk of your car or leave them in the garage. You know what you don't do? You don't walk in with those clogs, those shoes, and put your feet up on your living room coffee table. Well, that's what happens when we start moving towards burnout. What happens is we start taking all of that stuff that we didn't process at work that got viewed through the lens of negativity has a negative valence. And that stuff starts coming home with us and infecting the rest of our lives. And again, it's not your fault. It's not your fault. You're not choosing to do this. It's not putting the burden of blame on you for not being good enough to perceive these things as positive. No, please don't mistake what I'm saying. But you don't want to bring those clogs home, even if they never should have been that bloody in the first place. That, that's what I'm trying to get across. Once you start bringing this stuff home, once it starts accumulating, then you're in the burnout cycle. And the burnout cycle has two limbs that make a circle. It keeps feeding on itself. And on the one limb, you have the Maslach triad. And that's emotional exhaustion. You just don't have energy anymore. It starts sucking your drive and will to live, to perform, to get up off the couch emotional exhaustion. And then the second part of that triad, cynicism, also known as compassion fatigue. You just start snapping at patients, snapping at coworkers. You've lost your capacity for compassion. You've lost your sense of brightness and meaning in the job. And you spread that cynicism to everyone around you. You actually now are the one making sarcastic quips about the patients, about the job. And, you know, at first they were funny gallows humor when you were in a good place, and now they're not. Now they're tinged with real feelings of dislike, of lack of enthusiasm. And it's virulent. It's contagious. And then the third limb is loss of meaning. Now this is also sometimes... This third limb is loss of efficacy. You stop feeling a potency to what you do. You stop, you've lost touch with what you had when you were a bright-eyed medical student about going, doing good in the world. And instead, it just seems like this morass of meaningless activity. You're not accomplishing anything. You're not saving lives anymore. You're just moving the meat. All right, that's one limb of the burnout cycle. That limb feeds on the second limb, which is you become less likely to pursue restorative activities. You don't do the things that take you out of this burnout state. You don't do the things that take you out of a depressive state. You start pursuing hedonism and things that smother the hurt. Bad food, booze, drugs, bad TV, not getting off and exercising, staying on the couch, not sleeping well, doom scrolling, all of these negative activities and the loss of the positive ones. That's the second limb of the burnout cycle. And that second limb fuels the emotional exhaustion, the cynicism and loss of meaning. And then that cycle, in addition to feeding on itself, actually feeds back to mindset. And now even minor things at work that aren't even really challenges get perceived as enormous stress, enormous threat, because your lenses have gotten even thicker. You can only see the bad now. You can only see the negatives. 
And now you could see a vicious feedback cycle. Burnout cycle to mindset, mindset to stress and threat, stress and threat to burnout cycle. All right, so what are these green and red lines on this flow chart? The boxes in red are things that contribute to burnout. And the things in green are protective factors. The first box in red that feeds into a negative mindset are all of the system's issues that would be wonderful if they were fixed, but we don't often have that much control over it, short of just seeking a job that has a better alignment of these systems. Let me read them off for people that are not looking and talk about them. So the system's issues are a misalignment between ideal, the things that would work for you and what actually is, of workload. It's obvious. Rewards. Now, money is one of the rewards. There's others as well. Um, and, you know, Money could go somewhat of the way to making a horrible system feel a little bit better. But I think it just slows the burnout. It doesn't eliminate it. Money alone does not solve all things, even if we thought it might. And maybe for the short term, maybe you work a horrible job for two years, pay off all your student debt, and then you go to a more um, humane type place. Okay, well, maybe. But long term, I don't even think money is going to do it if everything else is totally in disarray. Values or purpose. Um, does the job make you feel like you're, you're fulfilling your values, what you want to be doing in life, in your career? Then next up is control or autonomy. Do you have the ability to determine your own fate? Do you have the ability to determine how you see patients, when you see patients? Um, or is it an onslaught of things outside your control? Is your voice matter in your group? Um, or is it some corporate overlords that have no desire to hear from you as the actual line worker? Fairness. Are some people in your group, you know, getting amazing stuff and you feel like you're being crapped upon? You get all the nights, you get like, you know, three weekends a month. All right, that's going to certainly feed into your mindset. And then community. You know, it's, it's protective when people around you at the job got your back. When you feel like, you know, even though things are hard, you're going to visit, you're going from one family in your home to another family at work. That's immensely protective from burnout. And then this one, you know, all of those were actually outlined by Maslach, and she is the amazing researcher. It's done so much for burnout in medicine. This last one I add actually came from Dan Pink's Drive, and he actually put one additional one that Maslach didn't have, which is, are you getting the sense of mastery practice, meaning are you getting better at the craft? Are you given the opportunity to expand your skill set, to learn new things? And that's also very protective. It's why residents will deal with what is a very tough gig for three to four years because every day they're there, even though it's hard, even though a lot of these systems issues may be misaligned, the protective factor is they are doing it because they are learning, because they are becoming better, because they have sacrificed their day-to-day -day happiness slightly in order to become better physicians. They understand, wow, I'm working a lot of hours, but each hour I work makes me have more potential as an intensivist or ED doctor, and that's why I'm doing it. And even after you get out of training, if you have a job where you are learning and expanding and becoming further down the path of mastery, then you might put up with a lot of crap without it slipping to burnout. On the other hand, if you don't have any furthering of your mastery, that is a job that is not making you feel fulfilled. All right, so these are the systems issues that change that mindset, that make you perceive the challenges that work differently. Let's talk about one more negative before we go into the protective factors, the things we talk about in coaching. Moral injury. Now, this is slightly different to burnout, though they are certainly negatively synergistic with each other and they're related. Many of the things that cause burnout could also cause moral injury. Moral injury is when your very core values as a physician or as a human are being violated by the work you are doing. What's an example? During COVID, when we had patients who had to die without seeing their loved ones, patients dying in a hospital room with no one around them, uh, maybe someone being called on an iPad if you were lucky and watch them and then listen to the misery of their family. Um, that, that's a moral injury. I could think of countless others. You can too because you're exposed to them on a regular basis. 
moral injury, it would be the five-year-old resuscitation where you think things were done incorrectly and a kid died who didn't have to. That same resuscitation of a five-year-old may be devastating and sad, but it's not moral injury unless you think things should have been otherwise. It's when your core values are violated that moral injury occurs. And moral injury begets that triad that is part of the burnout cycle, emotional exhaustion, cynicism, and loss of meaning. Moral injury is a force multiplier of those negative valence thoughts and emotions. Yeah, moral injury is a bad, bad thing. If that's occurring, then you are much more likely to experience burnout. All right, now let's talk about the protective factors, the things we actually try to do in coaching to stave off burnout. Like, Because like I said, we often don't have access to the systems level issues. What we have instead is working with the individual to deal with the situation as best they can and get back from burnout to a place of joy on shift. That's what we want. We want joy on shift. All right. So the first thing we work with oftentimes is we eliminate as much as possible the challenges, right? We can't get rid of them entirely. But if we mitigate the number of challenges, then it's a lot easier to do with the ones remaining the stuff that is safe and mentally stabilizing. So we work on shift efficiency. We work on EMR mastery, templating, proper workflows so that you don't have to wait for an hour after shift before you go home. You don't have to wait three hours in some cases. Getting out on time is a burnout prevention tool. Margin on shift. Are you working at 120%? That is going to burn out anyone, even if everything else is great. You know, you should be working at generally 85 or 90. You know, you, you have a little bit of margin there for taking a breath, for shift hygiene, going to the bathroom, eating, taking two minutes outside to see the sun. Having that extra 10% for when a really sick patient comes in, being able to take care of them. If you're working at 120, any machine would burn out. You can't work beyond your capacity, and yet we try to do it all the time. And we're encouraged to do it by the entire system around us. And we, we teach our clients that, no, you have to reject that. You can't allow yourself to get sucked in. Short term, sure, you know, there's a huge surge of patients and you, you put it into overdrive for a little while and then you ease back, yeah, we all do that. That's what you should do. But if you're at overdrive during your entire shift, every day you come to work, it doesn't work. You're, something has to give. All right, and now I've mentioned this, but I, I wanna say it explicitly. Restorative actions on shift. There is never a shift where you haven't had a mass casualty incident, where you don't have time to go to the bathroom, where you don't have time to take two minutes to eat something, potentially something healthy and restorative, not something crap from the vending machine, where you can't go outside for one or two minutes, see the sun and walk back inside. And then we work a lot on communication with difficult consultants, with coworkers, to lead to a situation where you have less challenging activities. If you know how to communicate, if you know how to deal with consultants, then your potential for stress goes down and the shift becomes easier and you feel better and you don't hate your job as much. All right, so that's the first box of protective factors. That works on the challenges. Now we have a protective box for the mindset. And some of the things we work with are agency, taking back control over the things you actually do have control over. Many of the things we all talked about in that first box, right? You do have control over how quickly you see patients. You do have control over eating, drinking, and uh, toileting during a shift. You do have control of your workflow for the most part. They'll make you think you don't, but you do. You do. All right, and then the dichotomy of control, a stoic philosophy idea that you should only worry about the things you actually can change. And if you can't change it, do not give any mind space to it. For instance, I know many physicians, and I have some of them as clients, who cannot stand that patients come in with stupid complaints in their minds or uh, seeking uh, opioids. And it drives them crazy. It ruins their whole shift. Why is this patient coming in at 4 a.m. with back pain when they have an appointment with their orthopod in two days? And it drives them crazy. And I tell them, like, okay, well, could you do anything about it? No. Could, could you, you know, fix the system and, and prevent people 
seeking drugs coming in? No. All right. Well, what have you made better by dwelling on it, by making yourself miserable, by uh, encouraging the voice in your head that is saying, hey, you should really get angry about this because that's going to change the world. Well, it, it won't. It won't. You're just burning through your own mental well-being. And we, we talk about this a lot. We actually assign a dichotomy of control worksheet to have people, when they have stressors at work, we ask them, can you change it or can't you? And if you can't, then you just need to stop as much as possible dwelling on it because it is, it is fueling the fire. It's making things worse. All right. Now, that leads into a lot of the practice of physician coaching, which is inner voice work. People have inner critics. They have inner doubters. They have inner perfectionists. They have inner judges. And these inner voices can be incredibly deleterious. And we do work on awareness, on cognitive distancing, on how to deal with these voices that are trying to help you, but they're doing it in a really ham-handed way. And that inner voice work permeates so much of what we do. And if you scratch the surface, so much of physician coaching comes down to dealing with negative inner voices, negative statements by inner voices. All right, we deal with process versus outcome, which is the mark of maladaptive versus adaptive perfectionism. Adaptive perfectionists deal with process. Maladaptive perfectionists deal with outcome. And a lot of us in the medical profession are perfectionists because it's what got us here. But what got us here could be exactly what leads us to be miserable. So you have to turn off all of the instincts that got you through medical school and residency if you want to be happy. And process versus outcome is one of the ways. Uh, we teach our clients flow games. These are each shift you choose a gamification method and you go with that for the next eight to 10 hours and you make the shift into a game. And we have, I think at this point, we have like 30 of them on our list. And, you know, it might be something like external gratitude is the flow game. Every single person who does anything for you on shift, you thank, you know, uh, in with incredible levels of enthusiasm. Not for them, though, they'll be happy, but for you. And we see how you feel after that. Um, we, we have, you know, these countless little games you could play. Um, embodied meta, where uh, your job is to make every single person you encounter a little bit better off for having uh, come in contact with you. And you do that for eight hours and see how you feel. And we keep journals of all of these things. And then we see how it changes our perceptions of stress versus challenge, of threat versus challenge. And these could be amazingly potent. All right, now we get to the point of where you have this stress and threat at work, and now you're about to... Uh, bring it home. Well, we talk about boundary rituals, the way of keeping the things at work from permeating your home life. Uh, my, my buddy Rob calls this, you know, the driveway or garage exercise. It's a, uh, it's a pseudo meditation on actually releasing all of the things you had at work. Not entirely, because you might want to talk about those things with a loved one, but eliminating the negative valence of them as much as possible, trying to not let them cause a bad mood when you get home and actually have to deal with your family or talk to loved ones. So those boundary rituals are one of the things to stave off the burnout cycle. And then we come down to actually breaking the cycle itself. And we have a box here that deals with both how to um, deal with the emotional exhaustion, the cynicism, the loss of meaning, as well as the moral injury. And this box includes such things as learning methods of processing, learning to deal with these negative emotions that come home with you, both from a mental perspective, but also from an embodiment perspective, learning how to take the actual stress and pain that's kept within your body. And, you know, this is not woo. This is not, you know, froofy stuff. I'm, I'm, we aren't, we're not life coaches. We're not going to do chakra manipulation. This is like real stuff. This is when you come home with an ache in your stomach that you can't actually figure out what it is. And it turns out it's just that's where you stick your stress. You got to get rid of that. Uh, that's real. That's it's scientific. Uh, we're finding that cognition extends beyond the auspices of the brain, that your uh, central nervous system actually isn't all that central, that your gut, your uh, other nerves throughout your body actually are part of your CNS in essence, even though anatomically they're peripheral. All right, uh, we talk about burnout buddies, uh, the friend you have uh, who may or may not be a physician who you could process these stressors with, not from a clinical perspective, though having one of those is fantastic as well, but from the perspective of they, you found someone who knows how to listen, who knows how to not, uh, you know, 
ask you, well, why'd you do that? Or to caruminate, to just take your side on everything uh, in the, the wrong fashion it actually makes things worse. So when you find a good burnout buddy, that becomes a releaser of negative stress. We talk about journaling. We talk about gratitude, a process that's there not for the people or things you're thankful for, but for you. If you start getting, putting on the lens of gratitude, it take, forces you to take off the burnout lens. And we talk about meditation. Not for all of the you know, spiritual enlightenment benefits. Uh, I gave a lecture called Meditation Being Kettlebells for the Brain. It's just another form of exercise that everyone in our specialty should be doing, not because it's going to get you closer to, you know, uh, being a bodhisattva, but because it turns off your default mode network. It turns off the area of rumination in your brain. It allows you awareness of all the other things that are going on that kind of sneak past you, the inner voices, the negativity. And that's why we, we recommend meditation, because it actually changes your brain to be more able to process and deal with the threats that lead to burnout. All right, last box of this MCRIP burnout model, the protective factors for being less likely to pursue restorative activities. And obviously, the protective factors are to pursue the restorative activities. So, you know, that's why I do episodes on sleep, movement, which encompasses, you know, uh, mobility, exercise, um, fitness, muscle building, all of that stuff, protective, light, we're, we're finding out more and more, you know, Andrew Huberman's work is fantastic for this, on the necessity for sunlight, regardless of any other protective factor. Good nutrition, restorative relationships, getting out to nature. We were built for that. We were not built to stay inside. Even if you're not a nature person, even if you're a homebody, you got to get outside. You got to see forests. You got to see oceans. You got to see lakes. Flow and mindfulness practices, hobbies that lead you into a flow state. Flow state is protective from burnout. Mindfulness, like I said, uh, in the same vein as meditation, but it doesn't have to be meditation. It could be anything that leads you to focus away from your internal dynamics. And then play and laughter. Um, and if you don't have enough of that in your life, then that might be one of the really you know, negative synergizers for burnout. Whew, I'm losing my voice, but we're, we're, we're done. That is the MCRIT burnout model. And like I say, if you come to mcrit.org slash 349, you can download it or watch the video in which I go through it. Um, but if after hearing this, you want to hear more, then there's two ways to do that. One way is Rob Orman and I have created a cohort course, 12 weeks, um, I'm sorry, 12 sessions, um, six months, two hours a session of talking about burnout and how to prevent it and how to inoculate yourself, protect yourself. We call it the flame proof course. And if you're interested in that, um, then you better get soon because we're, we're getting near to the point of tickets being sold out. So that's the flame proof course. You could find it at flameproofcourse.com or it'll be linked in the episode notes for this show, mcurt.org 349. So that's flameproofcourse.com. Or if you're interested in pursuing individual coaching with me and talking about all these issues on a one-on-one -on -one setting, I'm really working through um, the space you're in to try to get you back to enjoying your shifts, to having joy while you're on shift and not having negativity permeate your life outside of shift, then just come on over to mcrit.org slash coaching. That site again, mcrit.org slash coaching. And it's also on the bottom of this burnout handout. I, I would love, love if you have comments, thoughts, things I've missed. I know many of the listeners are also in, uh, do work in this area. Please, please, please put in the comments and let me know. Uh, if you have things you disagree with, then I love hearing that, maybe even more than the agreement because it makes me better and it, it fixes gaps that I have in my own knowledge. So please, please come on over, comment about this, tell me what you think, tell me if you think this is valuable, tell me if you want to hear more or less of this stuff on MCRID. And please, no matter what you say, um, this is not going to take over any significant part of the clinical stuff. I know why you come to MCRID and it's to learn how to take care of critically ill patients. I get it. Don't worry. This will never, no matter what you say, will never be anything more than a small amount of the space we have on MCRIT. But I think it deserves that tiny bit of space. And I'd love to hear if you do too. Whew. Scott Weingart for the MCRIT podcast saying bye-bye.